Hello, and thank you for joining us once more for another entry into our 10,000 part documentary, A History of Stuff That Kills People. I'm your host, Cameron Armstrong. So we will take a look at one of the most infamous illnesses ever to afflict mankind, smallpox. I invite you to come along as we journey deeper into the history of smallpox and the efforts of humankind to combat it. After the 1500s, smallpox was present in most areas of the world. Most prominently, the effects of smallpox were heavily felt in the Americas after colonization because these populations had never been exposed to the disease before. After the Spanish conquerors arrived in 1518, at least one third of the Aztec people were killed by the disease. Smallpox was later used by settlers as a form of biological warfare to weaken the indigenous populations in the Americas. But just how were ordinary human beings finally able to curtail the destruction that was caused by this horrible disease? The answer lies with the history of vaccination, which began with an even older medical tradition, that of inoculation. Lady Mary Wortley Montague was the aristocratic wife of a British ambassador stationed in the Ottoman Empire in 1716. Lady Mary wrote extensively of her travels, and her book, Turkish Embassy Letters, was well received in its descriptions of the Eastern lifestyle. While in Istanbul, Lady Mary came across the Ottoman's practice of inoculation and wrote about it to her friend, dated the 1st of April, 1917. The smallpox, so fatal and so general amongst us, is here entirely harmless by the invention of engrafting, which is the term they give it. People send to one another to know if any of the family has a mind to have the small box. They make parties for this purpose, and when they are met, the old woman comes with a nutshell full of the matter of the best sort of small box, and asks what vein you please to have opened. She immediately rips open that you offer to her with a large needle and puts into the vein as much matter as can lie upon the head of her needle, and after that binds up the little wound with a hollow bit of shell, and in this manner opens four or five veins. Then the fever begins to seize them, and they keep their beds two days, very seldom three. They are very rarely above twenty or thirty in the faces, which never mark, and in eight days' time they are as well as before their illness. Where they are wounded, there remains running sores during the distemper, which I don't doubt is a great relief to it. I am patriot enough to take the pains to bring this useful invention into fashion in England. Perhaps if I live to return, I may, however, have courage to war with them. Lady Mary was set on saving her children from the horrors of smallpox. In 1718, she had the embassy surgeon inoculate her five-year-old son. Once Lady Mary returned to England, she ordered her four-year-old daughter to be inoculated in front of the English court. This was the first professional inoculation performed in England. Lady Mary then publicly advocated for inoculation within Britain, spreading the information to those who would listen. Those who survived smallpox were now immune to the disease, 
immunity was not inherited. In China during the 10th century CE, the idea of inoculation was first invented. The Chinese discovered that immunity could be achieved if a healthy patient was given a milder form of the virus to fight off, namely powdered smallpox scabs. This practice of inoculation spread to India, the Ottoman Empire, and Africa by the 1700s, most likely through word of mouth and amateur pr practitioners. There's a good chance that common people in Europe had been using the technique for a while as well. Okay, now, let us turn to another important chapter in the history of inoculation. Cotton Mather was a Puritan church minister in Boston, Massachusetts in the early 1700s, who was also a member of London's Royal Society. One of his slaves, a man he purchased in 1706 named Onesimus, explained to Mather how he had been inoculated in Africa. Unfortunately, very little is known of Onesimus, except that he remained a slave in Mather's household until he was later allowed to purchase his freedom. Onesimus used the scar on his arm to demonstrate the process in 1716. When a smallpox outbreak ravaged Boston in 1724, Mather used Onesimus' information to promote inoculation in the city. Only one doctor supported Mather's pro-inoculation stance. In a pro-inoculation letter written by Cotton Mather in October 1721, Mather said, Of all the number that have passed under the operation, there is not so much as one miscarried. It has done well in all, and even beyond expectation in the most of them. The patients return to the perfect health immediately and suppose themselves rather better than they were before the operation. For 70 years, inoculation became the primary defense against smallpox in the Western world. However, the invention of smallpox vaccination by Edward Jenner in 1796 replaced inoculation. Rather than infecting humans with a mild form of the smallpox virus, Jenner instead inoculated people with cowpox. Jenner pursued the idea after hearing that dairy maids who had suffered from cowpox could not receive smallpox. Cowpox is a mild infection from cows that caused a few spots on the cow's udder and could transmit to a human's hand. The infection did not cause much comfort, and thus from the popularity of inoculation in the Western world, the first vaccination came to be. On our next episode, we will delve further into the history of vaccination, its proponents, and bizarrely, its detractors. I want to thank you for joining us for this episode of a history of stuff that kills people. I'm your host, Cameron Armstrong, reminding you that what doesn't kill you makes you smarter.